as NASA and its contractors start dabbling once again with notions of a return to the moon, testing out their new spacesuit and vehicle designs, and as India celebrates its first lunar probe, perhaps it's an appropriate time to remind ourselves of what we know of the Earth's solitary companion, the object that has been at the heart of poetry, myth, song and imagination for so long. Not least when 40 years ago, Neil Armstrong, the first Scot on the moon, left behind his footprints followed by a small group of other men. One who even left behind a photograph of his family on the lunar dust. And all climbing into the seemingly ramshackle metal boxes as they hurtled through the emptiness between our worlds. Its phases sketched famously by Galileo, but also understood by others as a result of reflected sunlight as it orbits the Earth, are one of nature's constant beauties, from crescent to beaming full disk. Many maps have been drawn, and even a small telescope such as our little reflector will show clear and sharp details accentuated when the moon is not full, so the shadows of mountains and valleys provide added depth and contrast. And the 28-day periodicity of the phases, with the word moon from mensis linked to menstrual, month and Monday. The link with the tides too was noted, but only explained by Newton's gravitational physics. Dragging the ocean waters out on either side, locking rotation and sea together in synchronicity. Us staring at only one face, the far side a mystery until the space age brought Russian probes and American feet. This locking of the rotational period and the orbit means that although the moon does indeed rotate on its axis, we never see the other side. Although in truth, nothing is perfect and there is a slight variation called libration, so that in time, if we watch very carefully the surface details, we can ultimately sneak a peek of up to 59% of its surface. The pull and drag of Earth, ocean and moon means that angular momentum is being transferred. In simple terms, the moon is steadily, gradually drifting from us at about 3.5 centimetres per year. It's now one and a half metres further away than when Armstrong and Aldrin wandered on its dusty surface. The other reason for historical fascination has of course been the phenomenon of eclipses and the Moon is responsible for two kinds, solar and lunar. The closeness and apparent size in the sky of the Moon and the Sun makes solar eclipses not only possible, but utterly beautiful, blocking the brightest daylight and carving a dark shadow across the face of the Earth where the temperature drops and birds fall silent. until the diamond ring of the sun returns. Eclipses, of course, can happen with any object passing in front of another. Here's an example of the Earth eclipsing the sun as seen by Apollo astronauts traveling from the moon. In Earth's case, you can see the effect of the atmosphere through the extended ring and its range of colors. Or perhaps an even more spectacular shot from a space probe to Saturn, taking an image of that planet blocking the sun, where the rings are illuminated in sunlight and Saturn is in shadow. This particular image is also famous for having captured the tiny blue dot of the Earth in the distance, seen in a gap in the rings as tiny 
and almost insignificant. Lunar eclipses are when the moon passes into the Earth's shadow. Yet in this case, the moon might be a dark, deep, copper-red colour rather than totally invisible. This illumination caused by sunlight being refracted or bent around by the Earth's atmosphere.